Do you see um, family programming coming back? You know, after all this reality phase and all this stuff. No, I don't. I, I see where you're going with the question. I don't see it. That was John Amos giving his thoughts on family programming coming back to rule the entertainment industry. And it turns out his opinion might have been formed by his experience on the set of Good Times. Speaking of the show... Was some of the contention about JJ's behavior and how goofy he was... And I accepted we needed the comedy relief, but by the same token, we felt it could have been dealt with a little more seriously. Little did Amos know that his very simple opinion on that matter would change his life. Been fired off the show, collect unemployment after that for good time. But Amos wasn't even the only one fighting for an uplifting image of the characters on the show. His on-screen wife also fought some battles of her own to that effect. I give a lot of that to Esther Rowe because she wanted a husband on the show. They wanted to do it without a husband. And she said, no, I want a husband on the show because I was raised with a, a father and a mother. If you were around in the mid to late 90s, then there's a huge chance that you witnessed what many have tagged the best days of television in history. It's ironic because this was the period that TV shows and movies just started to pick up in the industry, following the regular stand-up shows people went to see live. However, as with anything in its early days, television was far from perfect, and there was no better depiction of this than what happened on the set of Good Times. The show, which was one of the pioneer ushers of many of the biggest 90s shows, also had its own set of challenges, and it seems those challenges might have been some of the factors that led to its sinking. But until those final days, Good Times echoed greatness in its rawest form. Like many of the shows that were ruling television around the same time it came out, the show was majorly premised on comedy. However, a little twist was added by the producers of the show to decide to incorporate family values into it. So now we have a show that is, for starters, filled with black comics, with extensive years of individual success to their belts, coupled with them being one happy family. It was almost like the show couldn't be more perfect. The fans of the show would later learn that all of the ingredients that made up the show, although more impressive than any of the others airing at the time, was not enough to keep it on top. See, while many people looked at the show and saw some level of perfection in it because of how the cast members appeared in their elements, the reality of those actors was far from the depiction we were seeing. According to the accounts of many of the show's main cast members, some very much less than ideal things had been happening on the set that led to it taking the darkest possible turn. Now, these people who had to live through the hardship being imposed on them by the show's executive are finally coming out to speak on it after staying quiet for over three decades. And let's just say the things they're revealing might ruin some of the childhood or even adulthood memories you might have had of the show. And to prove just how serious this is, several fans have been talking about what they thought happened to the show. Well, let's just say some of them just got the shock of their lives and aren't handling it too well. Normally, this is the part where I tell you to stay tuned on the show till the end, but I have a feeling that it goes without saying on this one, at least for every millennial watching. And people mis mis misinterpreted my objection. They thought that I was jealous of him. And quite frankly, I was not, I'm not jealous of any successful comedian. While there have been many top-rated shows come and go over the years, most people would agree that there are certain shows that attained icon level right from the pilot. And Good Times just might be the leader of that category. A feat that seemed impossible for a show that was expressly based on the life of a black family. Well, at least until the show's producers messed around and lost their touch, that is. Although the tales of James and Florida Evans' family may be a little less zeitgeisty these days than those of Art Archie and Edith Bunker, it's important to know that for a generation of people, black people especially, but not exclusively, Good Times was a hugely important TV touchstone. One need look no further than the blackish fantasy episode that imagines the Johnson family as the cast of Good Times for proof of that. Now, people have always gambled and they always will. It's the world's second oldest profession. What's the oldest? <laughs> You're too young to know. Oh, that. While it falls in the pantheon of Norman Lear's 70s sitcom universe through the character of Florida Evans, who was first introduced in Maude, itself a spin-off from All in the Family, Good Times is more of a distant cousin to those shows. Unlike its predecessors, Good Times was not created by Norman Lear. That credit goes to Eric Monte and Michael Evans, who played Lionel Jefferson on All in the Family and the Jeffersons. Lear developed the show to incorporate Florida, Maude's housekeeper on Maude, played by Esther Roll. Hers was the only character Carrie 
carried over, with her history and husband changed to fit the framework of Monty and Evan's show. Good Times was a phenomenally successful CBS sitcom that aired from February 8, 1974, until August 1, 1979. The show was set in Chicago, with the family living in a housing project that was based on the infamous Cabrini Green projects. Episodes of Good Times dealt with the character's attempts to overcome poverty. James Evans was portrayed often working at least two jobs, mostly manual labor such as dishwasher, construction labor, etc. Often he was unemployed, but the character is a proud man who will not accept charity. When he has to, he hustles money playing pool, although Florida disapproves of this. A track record like this makes you wonder why the show didn't do more numbers than was recorded. Well, it turns out there's actually a lot to unpack there. While everything seemed peachy from a viewer's line of sight, there was a lot of friction happening on the set, particularly with the show's lead characters. See, while John Amos, who portrayed James Evans, the patriarch of the show, was part of why it became as successful as it did, certain changes were made to it that shocked everyone. Much to the chagrin of the show's supporters, James Evans was K-Ed during the height of Good Times popularity. Many wondered why the show's producers would make such a decision, and over the years, rumors surfaced that they and Amos could not reach an agreement in their contractual negotiations. In May of 2015, in his three-and-a-half-hour interview with the Archive of American Television, Amos shed light on exactly why he left Good Times. Well, that was the thing about uh, working with Norman Lear. He liked to get the actor's input, but by the same token, he couldn't relinquish control of the show to the actors. The truth of it was when the show first started, we had no African-American writers on the show, and some of the attitudes they had written, as per my character, and frankly, for some of the other characters as well, caused me to say, uh, uh, we can't do this, we can't do that. And they'd say, what do you mean we can't do this? Amos continued. They'd go on about their credits and the rest of that, and I'd look at each and every one of them and say, well, how long have you been black? That just doesn't happen in the community. We don't think that way. We don't act that way. We don't let our children do that. The industry vet admitted he didn't express his grievances in the most professional manner, which resulted in his character being k off and him getting the boot. The clashes with the writers more often than not affected John's time on the show. He believed the scripts were not authentic enough to portray the black American experience and felt he knew better about such families than the show's white writers. If you think about it, it doesn't seem like too much to ask that a man who's lived through what the life of a suburban black family is, be consulted for what that life is actually like, compared to people with degrees and no real-life experience. This was the basis of what caused friction for Amos on the set. According to details from the actor himself, the show's behind-the-scenes team of writers in its early years was majorly made up of white people. He revealed that while these people did have the technical know-how to create great scripts, their creations had elements of negative stereotypes about black people. In a chat with Vulture, he said being the first black father of a complete family on television meant he shouldered an immense responsibility. Hence, he was not going to portray something less than redeeming. He noticed that the writers were losing focus on his other two kids on the show, Bernadette Stannis, who portrayed Thelma, and Ralph Carter, who played Michael. John believed the show could have gotten a great deal of mileage out of Thelma and Michael's aspirations to become a Supreme Court justice and surgeon. I felt that with two other younger children, one of whom to aspire, who aspired to become a Supreme Court justice, that would be uh, Ralph Carter or Michael. Instead, the writers focused more on the obvious and comedic Jimmy Walker, which John was not proud of. He explained he was not jealous of Jimmy Walker, but felt it was a disservice to Thelma and Michael and young people's image to say they did not matter. The differences I had with the producers of the show was that too much emphasis was being put on JJ and his chicken hat. When asked if those feelings led to his being kicked out of the show, John said, yes, it was. I was categorized by Norman as a disruptive element. When he made the call telling me I would no longer be with the show, he said that's how I was described and assessed by the rest of the cast, and certainly the production company, a disruptive element. So they kid me off. That I wasn't as important as I thought I was to the show or to Norman Lear's plans, and he was not about to have a disruptive factor. That was me. However, Amos wasn't the only major character who had a problem with the portrayal of black people. Even his on-screen wife, Esther Roll, had the exact same concerns. Roll took issue with the way her TV son's character evolved. She told Ebony Magazine, 
He's 18 and he doesn't work. He can't read and write. He doesn't think. The show didn't start out to be that. They have made him more stupid and enlarged the role. She continued to vent her frustration, pointing out a descent into stereotypes. Negative images have been quietly slipped in on us through the character of the oldest child. I resent the imagery that says to black kids that you can make it by standing on the corner saying, Dino might. Even fans agreed with their point of view. One person wrote, John Amos may have lost the battle, but he def won the war. His role on Good Times was a catalyst for shows like The Cosby Show, which gave us a different world, chain reaction for the culture. Salute to Esther for standing her ground. Well, just the way they didn't take Amos's view too kindly was the same way they didn't take roles. Only difference was that hers was slightly less intense. In Amos's case, the Evans family was prepared to move to the South at the beginning of the fourth season after James secured a better job out of state. But while he was away, he is K-Ed in a car accident, leaving the family stuck in Chicago without their patriarch. Role stayed on for the duration of that season, but eventually had enough herself. Her character was written off much more gently than her screen husband, however. The writers bid farewell to Florida by having her remarry and move off to Arizona. With the Evans children left to fend for themselves in Chicago, the show took a bit of a different direction. The ratings began to slip considerably during the fifth season, prompting producers to appeal to Roll to re-emerge as Florida on the show. Roll agreed that the sixth season would be the series' last. Roll continued to act after the finale of Good Times. Along with multiple television appearances, Roll acted in many films until her 1998 death. Among her post-Good Times movie credits are parts in the 1988 screen hit Driving Miss Daisy, while season 5, in which the remaining Evans children live alone, included one of the show's most talked about storylines. With Janet Jackson as abused child Penny, it did little to stop a drastic fall in ratings. The person who really keeps it together is out there clawing and scratching for jobs. That's your daddy. Before the taping of season six began, CBS and the show's producers decided that they had to do something drastic to increase viewership. According to Steve Mills, the then vice president of CBS programming, we had lost the essence of the show. Without parental guidance, the show slipped. Everything told us that our mail, our phone calls, our research, we felt we had to go back to basics. Roll agreed to return under certain conditions, namely more money and better storylines. In the season six premiere episode, Florida's Homecoming, Part 1. Florida returns from Arizona to attend Thelma's upcoming wedding to professional football player Keith Anderson. Ultimately, Roll's return wasn't enough, and CBS canceled the show during the 1978 to 1979 season. In the series finale, The End of the Rainbow, each character finally gets a happy ending. JJ gets his big break as an artist for a comic book company, with his newly created character, Dinah Woman, which is based on Thelma, much to her surprise and delight, and is moving into an apartment with some lady friends. I'm glad y'all got here for this news because I want y'all to know that now you are looking at a famous working cartoon artiste. Right. Michael attends college and moved into an on-campus dorm. Keith's bad knee healed due to his exercise and own physical therapy, leading to the Chicago Bears offering him a contract to play football. While Good Times coming to an end was shocking to fans all over the world at the time, it also made people more interested in each of their personal lives. It has been nearly 50 years since Good Times first aired, bringing fame to its cast members' careers. Although most of them can continued to act after the show ended, some have pursued different paths, while others have already passed away. Let's start with Esther Roll. Before the show, Roll was famous for starring in the 1972 sitcom Maud. She was a stage actress before being cast in a supporting role in the show, which viewers immediately fell in love with and wanted to see more of. After the show ended, she continued her acting career with small parts here and there in movies like Driving Miss Daisy and My Fellow Americans. She had a big part in a couple of other shows and won several incredible awards, one of which came in the 1970s. Specifically, in 1978, Roll won an Emmy Award for Outstanding Supporting Actress in a Limited Series for Special for her performance in the television film Summer of My German Soldier. Sadly, Roll passed away on November 17, 1998, a few days after 
she turned 78 due to complications from diabetes. The actress left behind her divorced husband, Oscar Robinson, whom she married in 1955 and separated from in 1975 without any children. While she ushered in a new age for women of color at the time by making a name for herself with good times, her on-screen husband had a vastly different reality. James Evans, known in the real world as John Amos, was already a known name in the entertainment industry before he landed a role in Good Times. Uh, under no circumstances must you stop eating and drinking, please. <laughs> because the ladies over at the refreshment bar have told me that they're not busy enough. Before becoming an on-screen actor, Amos took the stage by storm and even founded his own theater company. He also became a television star with a role on The Mary Tyler Show before landing Good Times. However, he left the show after three years of reported creative disputes with the show's developer, if you know what I mean. Anyway, in 1977, Amos starred in the miniseries Roots and earned an Emmy nomination for his impeccable performance. Amos continued his career and appeared in the movies a couple of other projects, including Coming to America, alongside Eddie Murphy. Although he is still active in the industry today, Amos is also a proud father of six children, whom he had with three different women. These days, however, Amos basks in his residence in Tewksbury Township, New Jersey. Although he's been in the news for other things in recent times involving his family, there hasn't been much on him getting back in front of the cameras. But the case for others was largely different, one of whom was Janet Dubua, who played Williona Woods, neighbor to the Evans family. I'm Willona. Fly me. <laughs> Fly me straight to the kitchen, pour me a cup of coffee, and make it like I like my man. Hot, black, and strong. Dubua was a multi talented performer known for being an actress, dancer, singer, and songwriter. Like many Hollywood stars, Dubua made her acting debut in theater and only joined television after gaining experience on stage. Although she appeared as a series regular in Love of Life, Dubois made her name known when she received a Peabody Award for the CBS film JT in 1969. She went on to star in I'm Gonna Get You Sucka and Charlie's Angelus Full Throttle and received two Emmy Awards for her voiceover work. Beyond her career, Dubua founded the Pan-African Film and Amp Arts Festival, which focused on talents from people of African descent. She also has an empowering youth project through the Dubua Care Foundation. Sadly, she passed away due to cardiac arrest after dealing with a lot of lows in her life on February 17, 2020. Unlike Dubua, who was already walking the path to becoming a star from her theater days, Jimmy Walker, who played James J.J. Walker on the show, didn't think Hollywood would be his career path. Here's a free sample for little sister. Afro Glow Face Cream for the look of beauty. <laughs> I didn't know they could borrow miracles. Before becoming an actor, his interest was in basketball, which did not seem to work well early on. After working a few jobs, he decided to try comedy performance and debuted as the opening act for the poetry group, The Last Poets. Walker played the oldest son on Good Times. He was a 27-year-old when he was tasked with the role, and it catapulted him into the stratosphere. While fulfilling his role as JJ, Walker also appeared on Fantasy Island and Let's Do It Again, among other shows. His fame, however, skyrocketed after the show, and he had more film credits, but once the show ended, he struggled to keep the TV momentum going. Fortunately, Walker was a stand-up comic before his role on TV, and that's the vocation he returned to after it ended. Walker tours the country doing stand-up an average of 25, 30 weeks a year. According to IMDb, Walker wasn't the only child of the Evans family who made a name for themselves, specifically with their role on the show, as that was also the case for Bernadette Stannis. Bernadette Stannis Stannis is most recognized for her role as Thelma Anderson in Good Times. The show that launched her career. Throughout the 70s, Stannis displayed grace and charm, which captured the viewer's heart, although she did not make acting her mainstay. He gave me this diamond engagement ring. It's a beautiful ring, Thelma. I see the ring, but where's the diamond? The actress was 18 when she landed the role of Thelma on the show. Over the years, she has talked about how it felt to be picked for such a role and the story behind her going for the audition. It was all thanks to her mother, who had been by her side, pushing her to perform in a pageant she had been preparing for. She had been fighting stage fright and trying to avoid the whole affair by feigning an asthma attack, but her mother did not have it. After Good Times ended, Stannis kept on acting, appearing in some other movies and plays, with one of the latest being her 
her role in 36-Hour Layover, which was released in 2016. According to reports, that was Stannis' last on-screen credit. However, she did pursue a career as an author and even penned five books, some of which earned her even more respect in the creative community. Since then, she's prioritized family above all else as she remarried Terence Red and together they welcomed a daughter named Dior Ravel. Currently, she is reportedly married to Kevin Fontana, with whom she shares her daughter Brittany. She takes her job as a mother very seriously and has done a pretty good job of bringing up wonderful girls who love her just as much as she does them. Stannis has come very far from the girl who played Thelma on Good Times, but the world will never forget the impact she has made both on the set and off it. Another iconic figure of the show is Ralph Carter. Right now, it's been more than four decades since Carter became an icon of African-American television, playing the role of Michael, the youngest son of the Evans family on Good Times. Pride of the Projects, Michael Evans! Oh, who needs you anyway? I wouldn't play with you again if you was the last kid in the project! Back then, Ralph was still a teenager, but Norman Lear, the producer of the show, saw something so unique in him that he gave him the chance to share the screen with Esther Roll and John Amos. And even though Good Times was Ralph's debut on television, he was no stranger to acting and being under the spotlight. At nine years old, he made his Broadway debut in the musical The Me Nobody Knows. During his time on the series, Carter became interested in music and released the album When You're Young and in Love in 1975. He also released two singles around the same time, and even appeared on Soul Train to promote the album, before taking a long break away from the spotlight. In 2016, he joined John Amos, Bernadette Stannis, and Jimmy Walker to celebrate good times and its longevity after 40 years. They did some press rounds, including Extra TV and Steve Harvey's show. On the other hand, Carter is now the face of the Audelco, short for Audience Development Committee, Inc., an organization created in the 70s by actress Vivian Robinson that honors black theater in the tri-state area. Carter is the vice president, and he believes that it's important for people to support local and black theater, not only for the actors, but for the village it takes to get a play running. Every year, Audelco hosts the VIV Awards to recognize the work of dozens of people in the theater. They also offer seminars, lectures, forums, and other theater activities focused on the young generation. One thing that has been consistent about the cast of Good Times so far is that they've all had multiple layers of their talents. And Johnny Brown was also no exception to this pattern. Known for his portrayal of Nathan Bookman, the building superintendent for the Evans family on the popular 1970s sitcom Good Times, Johnny Brown came with a lot of surprises when he broke into the industry. Brown, like most of his black contemporaries, would prove himself to be far more than just an actor something essential for African-American actors, as they first began to receive opportunities in roles other than as maids or butlers in the 60s and 70s. He also displayed his prowess as a singer and could easily swing into the role of an accomplished impersonator, mimicking the voices and mannerisms of such luminaries as Louis Armstrong and John Wayne. Fans of good times will recall him often swaggering like the Duke and sounding almost identical to the white actor and Western film superstar John Wayne. Brown's ability to tackle the roles of everyday people, along with his humor, charisma, and portly appearance, served him well both on stage and on the screen. This was proven by his track record of landing roles on shows including The Jeffersons, Family Matters, and Martin. However, disaster struck on March 22nd last year, when his daughter, actress Sharon Catherine Brown, confirmed news about his passing on Instagram. Our family is devastated, 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 beyond heartbroken, barely able to breathe. We we respectfully ask for privacy at this time because we need a minute to process the unthinkable," she expressed. Shortly after the news came out, Bernadette Stannis and Janet Jackson paid tribute to their co-star following his D at 84. That's the way love goes, singer Jackson, who played abused child Penny Gordon Woods in season 5, also shared her condolences via Twitter. Such loving memories of our time together. You were full of laughter and forever smiling, always so sweet and so kind to me. I love you and will miss you," she wrote. Speaking of co-stars, Janet Janet Jackson is another unforgettable star from Good Times who needs very little introduction. Jackson made her first appearance on the sitcom during its fifth season as the daughter of an irresponsible mother. In one memorable and, at the time, shocking scene, Penny's biological mom approached her with a hot iron as Penny begged her mother not to burn her. It's who here? I don't know his name, but he's tall, skinny, and beautiful. Hold on now. Tall and skinny we got. 
but beautiful. On the show, Penny ended up getting adopted by the Evans neighbor Wilona Wood and developed a puppy crush on Thelma's brother JJ. At the time, Jackson, who would go on to land other co-starring roles on the TV series Different Strokes and Fame, was best known as the baby sister of Michael Jackson and his brothers. The guys had already racked up a string of hits beginning in 1969 as the Jackson Five and later as the Jacksons. While the singer-come actress has been on a couple of shows over the years, her music has taken the front seat in recent times. Times. In fact, the singer even had a tour early this year called Together Again. So far, it's clear that everyone from the show has come a long way, moving through various parts of the industry and leaving their individual marks. This is why fans will never stop talking about them regardless of whether they're here or not, as their legacy has become eternal. That's it for this video, goodbye.